So, Sarah, well, why don't we just start with uh, what did we just do and, and where are we sitting? And <laughs> um, we are at MPAC at RPI. I just filmed my piece, Falsetto, uh, which is a percussion solo for a handful of um, little bells that I found at thrift stores um, and a few various percussion instruments. And um, in short, essentially is a, a situation I set up where I gave myself more things to do than I could possibly do. And then I try to do them anyway, and then I see what happens. And then uh, that's the, the crux of the piece is that um, to try to do all of the things required of you um, and then however, whatever failure happens, happens. And then that just becomes part of the piece. But it's uh, not a planned failure at all. It's, it's truly is me trying very hard to do the thing that is impossible that I assigned myself. <laughs> it seems like that's a theme in a lot of your pieces. And I was wondering about how you kind of choose the, the actions that you'll do at the same time and, and kind of what you're thinking about in terms of um, how you balance things that are just at the edge of what you can do, because you're obviously a trained musician, mm -hmm. um, but how do you figure out what is at the edge of impossibility in order to show that as an expressive parameter? I th with this piece, it was totally by chance that this and several other solo pieces of mine were created for shows in my town where I live in, Ithaca, New York, where someone asked me to play a local show and it's a small town. And so a lot of people who've seen me play before tend to come to all the shows and I don't wanna just keep playing the same stuff over and over again. So I started using shows in Ithaca to just try new things. And the first time I played this piece, I had absolutely no plan at all. Um, I had made a recorded version of this piece with all of the bells except without any of these other percussion instruments and without this like um, impossible performance. It was just a textural bell ringing piece. And so I, I literally, I was like, I'll just press play on that recording. And what I have in my house right now is a bass drum and some wood blocks and some maracas. And I'll try to play those and the bells at the same time. And I truly did not know what was gonna happen. I had absolutely no plan. I never practiced it the first time that I played this piece was the first live performance of this piece. And it, uh, I don't know if you could call it, well, no, I'd say it was refined. The more I have performed it, the more refined it has become, which is something that I've done a lot actually, where you have pieces that started as, I always think using the word improvised is kind of a strange word for a piece like this, or a lot of my other solo pieces that are very sort of, um, not minimal, but very focused in their material and intent. But I am improvising, like from moment to moment. And then the more I perform the piece, the more like a finished version emerges. And that's what's happened with this piece, where eventually the more I played it, the more like a finished version emerged as like a piece that, it's an abstract piece, but has kind of a narrative, I think. Um, well, not kind of, no, I think it has some kind of narrative, <laughs> even though it's not totally clear what what that is, but so it's sort of on the edge of like an abstract and a programmatic thing. It's like it's a sound piece, but it's also a performance piece. And like, I think it's pretty funny, but it's also like um, kind of horrifying at the same time. <laughs> and I like stuff like that a lot. Um, I didn't set out to make a funny piece, but, and I don't think that I make funny music in general, but I've really, what I've, one of the things I really like about this piece is that it seems to elicit this response where, like I played this in um, the Hudson Valley once and this person came up to me afterward and they were all nervous and they were like, can I, can I ask you a question? Is it, is it okay that I laughed at that? And I was like, yeah, like of course it is. <laughs> like whatever response you had is valid, but I really like that response and that it's, the person obviously thought it was funny, but didn't know if they were allowed to think it was funny. And I really like that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so many different layers of kind of the, the ridiculousness of all of the things that we put ourselves through to try to do at the same time, or yeah. the kind of, the, like you said, the, the terror of that, or the, the different ways that we all have to deal with them, and they're not 
a single thing at once. They're kind of all existing at the same time. Yeah, totally. Do you think that, um, so you chose the title falsetto for this piece. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that influence kind of, or do you think that that influences the way that you're shaping the narrative or sharing the narrative with an audience? Or how did you choose the title? The title actually came, so this piece, the, the recorded version I mentioned, this piece and another piece called Everything Else appear on an album together that I made called Everything Else. And I made both of those pieces uh, uh, consciously in preparation to make this other piece of mine called Contralto that's like an hour long piece for a film with seven trans women and a live ensemble. And I knew that the, the material from those two pieces was going to be in Contralto. And Falsetto actually was the first title for Contralto and I didn't think that it was right. Um, and so I used it for this because um, f falsetto is one of the ways in which uh, assigned male at birth people can uh, artificially raise the pitch of their voice. And so, um, but doing that, speaking in a falsetto voice as someone who is born with a lower voice does not make you sound conventionally female. Uh, so it's this, it's the same spirit of, this piece of that you're trying to do something that you just can't do. And that was a key part of this piece, Contralto, that's a much more significant, well, not that this work isn't significant, but it's much larger multifaceted work, but that they both have the same at their core uh, that someone is trying to do something that is impossible. And there, there's various, you know, it goes in various ways, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, what I find re really moving about Contralto is this, idea that um, a kind of the the you you as the viewer don't necessarily have all of the background story mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it's kind of about whatever the voice that you have is is kind of your voice what does it mean to have a voice at all mm -hmm. I think is really powerful in that piece um, and I think that the yeah the way that you it's interesting to hear that the way that you came upon changing the title of it to, f to feel more in line with what the, right. the goal well, of the piece was. Because, I mean, at a base level, like, falsetto isn't actually what most trans women who want to change their voices do. And um, that was one of the reasons that I changed the title. Other than I just thought Contralto was a much better title. <laughs> but... Um, I totally forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, do you mind talking a little bit about Contralto? No, 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 no. Um, so uh, could you talk a little bit about the premise of the piece and um, just the kind of the idea of the speech therapy and, and, kind of some of the, and some of the things you've said about the piece and what this issue is of changing your voice or not? And Yeah, I just remember what I was going to say. It's related okay. to your question. Cool. Um, so... Before I knew exactly what contralto would be, and even before I had this vocal quote unquote feminization training piece of that of contralto, which ended up being like the basis of the whole piece, I knew that I wanted to make a piece that was not accessible to cisgender people in the way that it would be for trans people. And um, with falsetto and contralto, it's presented in this way that. It's different in the two pieces, but it's presented in this way that if you're an unsuspecting audience member and you just encounter this piece, there's a good chance that it will elicit the response of, what in the hell is going on here? And I think it's a common response of someone who's never had to think about gender nonconforming people, who's never met a trans person, that if they hear about it, their first reaction is like, that sounds crazy. But it's actually, it's not crazy at all. It's just you have to like understand why somebody would want to do that and then it, it isn't crazy anymore. Like I, I, several years ago now, I heard a radio news story where they were conducting this phone poll where they were cold calling people and saying, how do you feel about trans people? And they would go, ooh, I don't like them. And then they would say like, well, do you actually know what that means? And they go, well, no. And then they'd explain it to them and by the end of the call, they were like, oh, that sounds fine. And so it, with both pieces, I wanted to recreate this feeling of like, 
uh, someone looking in on something that they think is crazy but is actually very rational. <laughs> um, and then uh, it wasn't until I just kind of sat with that idea for a long time about like I just wanted to make a trans woman only space because that space doesn't exist in society. And then maybe a year later I was in this class at Ithaca College for um, it's a speech pathology class for trans people, but it's it's all trans women because not that trans men don't need voice training, but when trans men take testosterone, their voice is lower. They don't always they they don't have deep booming voices, but they generally have voices that are immediately read as male by almost everyone, and the reverse is not true. And so people go to this class to take it, and then. In the process of taking this class, I was getting more and more frustrated for lots and lots of reasons, um, most of them not worth going into. But what I, I was paired up with someone in this class who had just a profoundly deep speaking voice. And I started thinking about them and that no matter what she does to change her voice, this person will never, ever, ever be heard as female. But that person is still a woman and is still allowed to be a woman because they are. Um, and that was the sort of aha moment that I somehow had not realized before then, that it's not that we need to do things so that other people will feel okay about calling us a woman. It's that the reverse, that everyone else needs to change their expectations of like what a woman sounds like or what a man sounds like um, or what it even means to have a voice. Um, and so, like Julia Serrano uh, said in her book, Whipping Girl, that every minute of every day, every single person is making snap judgments about everyone's gender that they encounter all the time. Subconsciously, it's like you walk down the street and you see, that's a woman, that's a man. And it's 99.9% .9 of the population will always read someone as male or female. Um, and that's a hard thing to, like, to fight against. But that was the piece that I made, it's sort of. <laughs> That's one, pe one part of that piece, but it, it covers a lot of ground. <laughs> but um, that was part of the intent also, similar to this piece, is to, to put so much into it that it was difficult to make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I obviously have a, a different understanding of the piece from someone who's trans, but I also find the piece extremely moving in the way that it, it addresses some of those things of kind of how all of us are expected to perform gender. Yeah. You know, I think, and that, that can be really exhausting. Yeah. Um, or I find it exhausting. Yeah. And I, and so I, I find that really, really powerful. And I think that that, um, that's, or I, I think that speaks to everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, to have that as, uh, I think we see so many narratives that are supposed to speak to everybody that are usually um, seen just from a cis white male perspective that's mm -hmm. supposed to be, okay, those people are allowed to write narratives that are for everyone, that right. are universal, um, and that anybody else is writing a narrative that's only for that group of people. And yeah. Um, I, on the contrary, feel that this piece is something that really powerfully can speak to everyone and is a really universal thing and kind of helping people undo some of exactly what you were saying, this way that people make snap judgments or their own ways that they may or may not be aware that they feel as though they have to perform gender yeah. on a daily basis that I think is, is what is really powerful about the piece. Yeah, and one of the things that I wanted to do with that piece is, excuse me, to, I didn't want the piece to have any sense that I was trying to explain the actions of trans women at all. And um, so it, it uh, uh, I remember what I was gonna say. There was, I read a great a transcript of a panel discussion between a few different um, trans feminine writers and even though I didn't set out to educate people, it does have this sort of 
enlightening educational aspect to it because this writer um, in this interview that I read had said that simply by presenting a piece that centers trans people to a widely, mostly cis audience, that already shows them what it feels like to not be at the center of a piece of art, which um, they have experienced, you know, probably in almost all of the art that they have ever, or art or writing or whatever, that their experience, at least as far as gender is concerned, is always at the center. And I wanted to make a piece where it was not. <laughs> How did you find the, the people that you used in the film? Because were all of those women in your class? No, actually only one of them was. And then one of them was the teacher of the class, although oh, nice. she recently retired. And then one was the daughter of some friends of ours in Ithaca. Two are people from Baltimore, and two are just my friends in Ithaca. They, it just, people always ask me that, and the answer to that question is those were the seven people that said yes. That... I asked a lot more than that. <laughs> Not a lot more, but um, I asked several, f more than seven people, and those were the people that I could get to agree to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why. <laughs> but I also, I knew that I wanted some young people and some older people and some people of color, and so it's, it's a, it, you know, it's not just one type of person that's in the film. And I think it's interesting that even though um, your voice does appear in the piece, um, in the singing, oh, yeah, right? yeah. Um, your, your voice in the kind of the text of the, the text of the piece, um, kind of the answers is you are not one of the subjects specifically in the, the video. Um, did you, did you ever, uh, also include your own responses to the questions in the video and did it get cut out or was your initial concept always that you would not be visibly present in the... A little of both. I did film and then cut myself out of it, <laughs> but it wasn't, I wasn't performing the same material because mm -hmm. part of the way the films are shot is that I got, I didn't, I didn't tell people <clears throat> how to act or how to respond. I just wanted like I wanted their like real reaction to the thing. And I didn't think that I could do that because I had like a certain kind of response that I may have wanted or not wanted. And so I didn't want to guide it based on, on my own taste in that way. So by me not doing it, um, I didn't inflict my uh, intentions onto their responses. But I had filmed myself. I still want to use this for something, but it just didn't, it just didn't fit with the piece, but I had, come up with this whole idea where I had gotten these texts from a friend who studies tuning uh, for his PhD because I had been told as an undergrad that the way that we got the 12 tone system was that back in the you know 1500s or whatever it was that um, Rousseau and these other guys were fighting about what the new Western tuning system was gonna be. And the way we got 12 tone is that they realized it was too complicated to have things be perfectly in tune all the time. So they just fudged it a little. And they're like, 12 equal notes, which is crazy. Like that the entire basis of the last like 400 years of Western music is based on somebody who didn't want to do a good job because it was too hard. And so I had filmed myself reading these texts of these two people arguing, you know, someone calling the 12 tone system an ugly abomination and stuff like that. And it just didn't, <clears throat> didn't work with the piece at all, but I was drawing a connection between this and like the way that we got the gender binary and that it's like, well, it's just easier to have men and women. Like it's easier for most people to do that. But then what about the people who, you know, it's extremely not easier for a certain segment of the population <laughs> to just have men and women. Um, and then you get composers like Harry Parch, you know, who, created a 43 note scale because the 12 tone system was inferior basically. Um, and so I still think that's a really interesting connection that I would like to make some other time, but I filmed it and like I, my partner saw it too and we were both just like, this is stupid. Like this doesn't, this doesn't go here at all. But I did want to put myself in the piece and then took it out. <laughs> I think it's still re really lovely the way that, that your voice is in the piece 
and kind of uh, pulls the narrative through. Or and there's also a feeling that that you are behind the camera too. Mm-hmm. That the the gaze of the piece is from um, somebody who is sympathetic. Or did, yeah. did you do the filming yourself? Yeah, I did also? Everything. So I yeah. think. Um, I mean, that's something I think about here, too, is just kind of, um, it's not just about when you're a performer or composer and you're presenting your music or when you're in the middle of uh, documenting things, you know, who are the people in the room documenting what is their, mm-hmm. um, you know, their energy and how that affects the, the ability of the piece to come through. And, yeah. and I think in this... I mean, I think all the time it, it really matters that you have, um, yeah, who's behind the camera also really affects, for, for, for me, kind of. Yeah, totally. And I, I mean, I filmed it that way. Other than the two people from Baltimore, they were all, excuse me, they were all filmed in a little room of my house, hmm. you know, like a very small bedroom. And I, I did the Errol Morris thing where I didn't have a video screen, but I sat like the camera was here in front of my face mm-hmm. so that they would look at me, which is also directly into the camera. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of people it's, have said it feels really like private and intimate. And it's like, well, it was specifically shot that way. <laughs> um, it just, uh, you know, they're just on a white background so you can't tell that we're in a tiny little bedroom of my house. <laughs> you know, even when you have a really fantastic team, um, does it change? kind of depending on where an artist is and how comfortable they are um, to all, to be kind of filming a, a, you know, a feminist film with an all-male team or mm-hmm. to be filming, uh, you know, a trans work with an all-cis team or to be filming an all-black uh, artist work with an all-white team, mm-hmm. um, you know, does that affect the artist and how confident they are and whether or not they feel comfortable in the space. Um, I think some of that is knowing the team. I feel like we're really lucky here. And I'm not just saying this, that the the team is really sensitive and they're great people and they do such a fantastic job. But mm-hmm. I sometimes wonder with people coming in, like how much that's um, changes the effect of how comfortable people feel just being in the room when they don't know. Yeah. And they've had so many experiences working with audio engineers or video engineers that are awful to them um, and how that comes in. I don't know if that's something that you think about or... It's Uh, it's come up a lot because just because of the demographics of, you know, new music and experimental music. When when Contralto gets played live, um, I certainly have a preference for queer performers and if possible trans performers I mean the musicians that perform the score live but as a working artist invited somewhere where you don't know the people or you know you're just there to do your job I am not in the position to be like can you find me an all trans seven piece ensemble like it's just not gonna happen unfortunately and it would be for me, I don't know how other people feel, but for me, it's sort of, I don't love when most of the time I do that piece and it's like a mostly straight ensemble because it's kind of like, well, why are you playing this music? But it's, but it's also like everyone's working. Um, and so I'm pretty pragmatic about it, but certainly if I had my way, like I would be able to pick the people at every show, but um, a lot of times those people just don't exist. Um, and so I'm more just kind of like, yeah, it would be nice, but also it's probably not going to happen and that's fine. Like the, I thought about this for a while and ultimately the decision I came to is that the piece still comes off the same. Like the piece is still the piece. It's just a nice little added bonus if you can see that the musicians are in some way like personally connected to it. But for me, it didn't take away from the music as long as the musicians are, like you say, sensitive and competent and, you know, doing a good job. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hope that it's also, I was saying, something that is relevant to everyone and that examining that, some musician might play that piece who who hadn't had a lot of experience thinking about uh, 
those issues of performing gender or kind of, uh, yeah, snap judgments or any of that and, and to have to spend a lot of time with the piece and internalize that and, and by, by learning it, that that might give them the space, whether or not they talk about it to anybody, mm -hmm. to think about those things more deeply than they would otherwise if it's not something that they kind of were aware of for personal reasons or were even thought was possible if they didn't, you know, yeah. have that visibility in their life in some other way. Yeah, I was doing an interview with somebody on the phone once, a, a, a cisgender woman, I queer, I think, I think I remember her saying that, but about Contralto, and she was like, yeah, it's so interesting. I had just never thought about the sound of my voice in relation to my gender. And I, she caught me in a weak moment or something, and I kind of blurted out, like, yeah, because you don't have to. And she got really defensive and was like, I think about my gender. And I was like, I'm not saying you don't think about your gender, but you have the option to not think about your gender. And then she was kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I'm glad, I, I didn't like feel bad that that happened, I'm, but I'm glad that it did because I, I, it kind of brought that into perspective that this, the privilege of not having to constantly think about your gender in relation to like how you look and how you sound is like very exhausting and most people don't have to deal with that. Was the video always um, something that you knew you were going to put into a musical context, or what was? Uh, yeah, the, the idea of a film with musicians was there from the beginning, mm -hmm. but the way that it was made is that I shot, I gave each person the same, for lack of a better word, script, and I shot each, all of the material with all seven people before I edited anything, because I figured that, like I said before, I didn't have any goal or intention of like what I would get. I just wanted to see what I would get and then that would be the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and once I started, once I had all the videos and started editing it, it like, it, it took a long time, but it wasn't hard. Like it was very intuitive of like what the right thing to do was. And I, it's organized into several sections, which was predetermined, but um, the, I didn't write any music until the film was done. And so the, the musicians are sort of like, kind of like Greek chorus or something. They're like, not exactly a Greek chorus, but they, I always tell people who, when we're doing the piece that the, the musicians are not accompanying a film with a soundtrack. They're an equal partner, that it's a piece of music with a film and the musicians are on equal footing with the film. Uh, so like for it, just a, a practical thing is like the musicians don't always have to be dynamically under the film, that there's things written into the piece where the musicians are deliberately drowning out the film at certain points. And so they're, the film is like the eighth ensemble member, basically. Yeah. So it's, I, I think of it as a piece of music with a film, as, with a video component to it, rather than like a film with a soundtrack, which I guess is just kind of a semantic difference, but it feels, feels like a meaningful difference to me. <laughs> Uh, had you done other films before, or this is this is just something? Yeah, I just thought I could. I had I had this part of the way that it was structured with this like image black, image black was that um, that is artistically and aesthetically what I wanted to do, but it was also something that having never made a film before, I thought I technically could do. Um, so I didn't want to dream up an idea for a film that I then couldn't make. And I was like pretty sure even with no film knowledge that I could figure out how to shoot people from the shoulders up and like cut them in with black. <laughs> and so it was, again, it was sort of a mix of like practical and, and artistic choices. Uh, kind of related to that, how did you get into composing? Did you study composition formally or did, was it something that came out of your practice as a performer? I just, I started making weird improv noise music as a teenager, like 15, 16 years old. It was sort of an outgrowth of having been in like indie, weird indie rock, noise rock bands as a, in high school and <clears throat> discovered, right around the same time, discovered like quote unquote new music with like composers and Euro avant-garde and that kind of stuff, but also more sort of US underground 
weirdo music, basically. Like, the, well, the Wire called it the new weird America at one point. But, like, DIY underground... Uh, I know people don't like the word experimental, but I'm using it anyway. DIY underground experimental music, um, usually coming from, like, a background of, like, punk and indie music rather than people who studied experimental music or composing or whatever. And so that was my pre-music school background. And then I studied percussion in college and grad school, but was just composing music on the side, or not on the side, but I wasn't studying composition. I just have been composing since I was 15, 16, but wasn't doing it for a long time until I had done it off and on always. And then maybe, yeah, about 10 years ago, made some pieces where I was like, oh, this is, this is like something. And then that's, I've been sort of working in the same area ever since then. But I don't, I didn't study composition. I just have always done it. Like I always wanted to be a composer. Um, it just took me a while to figure out like what my path to doing that was. Cause I found it really, really, when I was in college, I was intensely into like Zanakis and Luigi Nono and like these really intense, rigorous, modernist composers, and I would try to write pieces, and, like, I would sit at my desk and, like, craft something on my big oversized score paper, and it would take hours, and then I would realize I had written, like, three minutes of music, and it was, like, making me crazy. Um, and, and not even making me crazy, I just felt like I wasn't good at it, because I probably wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't, I mean, I don't know, I have to check myself with my narrative because I also have pieces from like 1998 where I wrote a piano solo that's totally silent. It's like a, kind of a theater piece, but it's like, it's very weird that the things that are important to me now, I was doing at a really young age um, without really any influence. I mean, I have influence of course, but like no teachers or anything guiding me in any way, so. Um, I feel like a lot of my, like, how I've gotten to where I am with having a sort of personal practice has been more about, like, figuring out who I am rather than trying to, like, develop something where it's, like, I can look back at this piece from 20 years ago that was just the seed of something that I do all the time now, and it's like, oh, I've always cared about this. I just didn't realize it. And once you do realize it, then you can start, you know, making better pieces. Um, but I, uh, personally, I think it's an asset to have not studied composition, at least for me, like, cause like I said, I'm not the kind of composer that, um, needs to take an orchestration class. Like, I mean, I'm sure it would benefit me if I did, <laughs> but, um, I've, I prefer, have always sort of consciously tried to develop something that was sort of outside of existing technique. Do you, do you feel that some of that way of composing is also um, kind of doesn't get you to the sound world that you want or kind of gets you stuck in the process instead of the piece itself or? Yeah, kind of, because uh, like I'm a performer. Like I often will start to tell people like, oh, I'm really more of a composer these days, but it's totally not true. It's like I'm, it's not that I find the two things inseparable, but I can't imagine not doing either of them. And performance is just like a huge part of who I am and I just I love doing it I'm 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 excited every time I play and I think I just really get a lot out of being a performer and that totally influenced like how I sort of developed the work that I do now like it was totally out of um like I said earlier I of of having these pieces where I would just play them and that was how I was became to work and structure a piece was just through playing them in kind of an improvised way. You've talked about in other interviews too how uh, being a percussionist isn't necessarily about playing a certain instrument. Right. Because everything is, you know, um, everything is your instrument kind of. Um, and do you feel that you still though have a vocabulary of sounds that are a part of your voice as a percussionist and composer? Or do you still, uh, kind of feel like that um, 
you relate a lot to being a percussionist and playing all of these kind of orchestral instruments in every... I don't know. I, there's certainly there are two instruments that I feel deeply personally attached to, which is the drum set and the vibraphone. Mm -hmm. That because my I was a I started playing rock drums when I was nine years old and have done that longer than anything. And like I hardly ever play drum set anymore, but I off and on play with my friend Peter's group O Body, who's in Philadelphia and. I remember the last time that we went on tour, we were pre we were rehearsing, and I just blurted out like, "God, I just love to play drums." In one of our practices, because I just whatever I was doing just like felt so good, and feels like really innate, and I, I don't totally know why that is. And the vibraphone came much later, but it's very similar. That I feel really connected to those two things, but. Um, I don't know if I feel connected to being a percussionist or not, but I do, but not in the sense of like what that usually means to people. Like I actually don't really have, I'm not able to relate to a lot of percussionists most of the time. <laughs> um, I don't know, but it's, it's a weird practice. Like, like, like you said, it's like, we don't, Really well. I have a I have a spoken word piece where I play a bunch of these bells and and read this essay that I wrote. And it, the way that it starts is that I'm improvising on this table of like twenty bells or something. And I I say um, I'm ringing the bells and I say what I'm doing right now is uh, playing percussion. And the definition of percussion is as such that I could only play these bells forever for my whole life and still accurately be called a percussionist. And you, you, you know, just change out the instrument, like bells, newspaper, whatever, like, and that is really makes percussion a very weird practice. And the vast majority of the percussion world um, is extremely not weird and very homogenous and codified and um, it's unfortunate. <laughs> Do you think that it, um, some of that is the percussion being a relatively new solo instrument? Yeah, part of it is that we don't have classical music. You can't, um, there's no like Bach cello suites for the marimba, so people play them on marimba. But, so you have this, you have a lot of percussionists who don't care for adventurous music, which is totally fair, but then they all have to write new music so that they have something to play, and then you get this weird sort of subculture of, of capital P M percussion music that um, is kind of by entirely by and for percussionists, um, which I'm not even making a value judgment. Well, I kind of am, but um, e yeah, it just doesn't. I'm not. I don't feel connected to that kind of stuff, but it totally is. Excuse me, like you say, influenced by the fact that it's a new instrument. When in the other piece that you'll be playing tomorrow night, uh, Fleas, mm -hmm. uh, is the way that you use the vibraphone related to it being a standardized instrument in uh, kind of in contrast to the auxiliary percussion that's playing these kind of janky handbells, or is that not as much of a piece? Um. It's kind of the piece the the piece that I'm playing tomorrow night is sort of a ties together all of the things that I've been doing with the vibraphone like I have all these pieces where it'll just be like one certain thing for 10 20 minutes or whatever and actually both of these pieces started in exactly the same way they were totally spontaneous improvised pieces where I had to play a show in Ithaca and with this one it was like well I have this tape part and I'll just press play and then start playing and see what happens and then it I had another show to play where I was like, well, I'll just bring the vibraphone and I'll give a bunch of my friends bells and then I'll see what happens. And um, never intended to do it more than once. And then I did it and was like, oh, this is like something. Um, and it's the same sense then, the more I play the piece, the more I'm realizing what's cool about it and unusual about it. Um, but actually I hadn't thought of that until just now about putting these two pieces together. <laughs> that they are tied together in that way and that they're both, I don't really think of them as improvised music, but both, both pieces are improvised within a very specific space. 
do you feel that that um, if somebody else were to, or have you heard other people play these specific pieces? Mm -hmm. I guess you're saying there's no score for this, but someone could have watched a video of you and tried to do the piece. But. No, I don't know if anyone has dared. Um, <laughs> as far as I know, no one's tried to play this, but I don't. I have. I have solo pieces that are mine, and I will not give them to other people. Like, I have this hour-long vibraphone piece called Gather and Release, and, like, that's mine. I don't want other people to play that because it just feels really personal and important, and I, I don't want to give it I don't want to give it away. But um, other things, like, I have a um, solo vibraphone piece called Sisters that's two 20-minute pieces, and, like, I put the score up on my website because that to me feels like something that would really do well in the hands of other people. Um, and I don't feel like emotionally attached to it the way that I do certain pieces. Same with falsetto. It's like, I don't think I would want to see someone do this because not because I'm the most amazing performer in the world. I just don't think it would be satisfying to hear someone else do it. Um, cause it just feels like mine. <laughs> do you think that your, um, your practice is kind of moving towards uh, focusing on writing more music for yourself, or did you enjoy the experience of, of kind of writing these larger pieces? Because um, you've had some pieces that were written for other people now. Um, yeah, I've been doing quite a lot of commission stuff in the last year or two. And right. It's, it's really great, because cool. I mean, I'm happy to keep writing solo pieces, but like, I if I have the opportunity to do something different, then, like, I'll take it. Um, because, you know, like, I just wrote a trumpet solo. And it's like, I, I can't do that. And so it, just to have access to something other than what I can personally do is really amazing. And so I'm extremely interested in, like, any, almost anything that people ask of me. And I've had a couple commissions in the, recently of groups that I didn't feel really, like, aesthetically aligned with. Like, part of me was kind of like, why do you want a piece from me? And then I, I had the briefest moment of, like, maybe I shouldn't do this because it feels like a bad fit. And then I did it anyway, and it was great. Like, I tried to write a piece for that group that we would all be satisfied by. And then I got this totally different piece from what I usually make, but it still feels really connected to like the rest of my work, even though it's totally different. I don't know why I keep telling people is that I made these solo pieces called Psalms 10 years ago. And that was the, I was conscious of it at the time where I was like, oh, this is, this is it. This is the thing I've been looking for. This is what I'm gonna do for a long time. And the work has changed a lot since then, but I always use this metaphor of like, I made those pieces and it was like I jumped into a pool and the more work I make, the more I like swim around in this pool and the pool just keeps getting bigger. And that I, I can't say what like the concept is because there isn't one, but it, whatever falls under like the thing that I do feels like it keeps getting broader and broader, which is really, that's what I want. I mean, it's like by design. What are you working on right now? Um, I just finished mixing a recording of this hour and a half piece for cello and percussion for, written for a duo in uh, Knoxville called Two Way Street called The Reinvention of Romance that um, I'm very, very excited about. It's, I, it's something I wanted to do for a long time and then I got this request for basically the exact thing that I had been already thinking about doing. Um, so that's a record that will be out next fall, I think. And I have, I have recently wrote a cello solo for my friend Judith Hammond and then got asked to do an, a, a cello solo for a different cellist. So I have a second cello solo to write coming up. But other than that, not a lot. Well, actually, I guess there's a lot going on. There's uh, the album that I put out this year called Reservoir One. I, I already made Reservoir Two and I, I, I don't need to explain the whole thing unless you want me to. Yeah. But, <laughs> that I, I had, at the same time, I got asked by two different people to write pieces for an ensemble that was one of something and a group of something. So piano and three percussion or a flute and a vocal ensemble. Mm -hmm. And those came within like a few weeks of each other. And I was like, oh, well, this is a series. And so 
I devised this plan to make three pieces for three different ensembles, all an hour long, that could be played simultaneously or separately. And um, I'm gonna make the third one, I think, in 2021 in Santa Cruz with um, a group called Indexical, who are really great people. And if they're watching this, they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just all kinds of stuff. There's always stuff going on. It's nice. Good to be wanted. <laughs> So you recently started teaching at Bard, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you had uh, advice for young musicians or young composers, or kind of young anybody who is trying to put their voice out there, what do you say to those students? This comes up at Bard roughly every day <laughs> <laughs> of, of graduating seniors coming to your office and being like, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> um, what I always tell people is that they should create the situation that allows them to do whatever they want creatively. Um, whether that means like li living li like a bohemian in a van and touring or like having a day job so that you can have a house, which is what I did for many years, so that you can have like a house and a partner and a pet. and make music basically, you know, nights and weekends like everybody does. But you, I think that that suggestion of like, position yourself so that you can do whatever you want and you're not limited creatively at all is what I always tell people because um, the Bill Dixon, the jazz musician has this quote, the reward has to be that this is what you do um, because it's like the only thing you can count on is that like you have the privilege of like making art that yes you should like try to have goals and like be ambitious and do the things that you want to do but also you should know that like you may not achieve them because being a musician or an artist is like weird and hard and um there are lots of amazing people who no one's ever heard of and that but that at the very least you can have the satisfaction of like having a thing that like makes you feel good 